So uh, the last thing they organized is also I'm also one of the organizers, but I didn't do anything. I believe Adrian and Louis did most of the work. So, and thank you for coming to my talk. So today I'd like to share with you various bonds for functionals of independent variables. And there's a joint work uh, uh, with my MPhil student, uh, Zhu, and also my PhD, former PhD student, Zhu Song, and who is also in the audience. So if you have any questions, you, you can ask him, okay? <laughs> so I will start with uh, Chattach's uh, uh, 2008 paper, Chattach's new method of normal approximation for functions of independent variables. And then I'll give you a new Bellison bond and also give you some applications. And at the end, I will give you some Bellison bonds using extreme pair approach. Okay, that's my, the schedule of my talk. So let's start with a, a sequence of independent variables. So x is a, x1 to xn is a, is a random vector, and each xi are independent. So each xi are independent. So we are interested in the limiting distribution of a function of x. So w is f of x, okay? So the first question, of course, we want to, uh, to know is that what is limiting distribution, and mostly we want to see under what condition the limiting distribution is normal, okay? And then the second question is that, what is the error of approximation? And especially we want to see the, uh, what is the distance, which is, is not, of course, you have seen this definition many, many times, the L1 norm. And also we want to see what is the homogropal distance between the W and the V, suppose that V is the limiting distribution, okay? Those are two quantities. And in order to answer those questions, so I follow Chattach's 2008 paper, so we introduce x prime, which is the independent copy of x, okay? And also, short notation, the n, uh, black n stands for the set, from, uh, the integers from one to n. And then we, for any subset a in this, uh, from one to n, and we define x super a, means that if the components, the index i belongs to a, then we change x i to x, the independent copy. Otherwise, we keep the same x. Okay, so that's the definition. So we introduce the uh, difference operation that are gf of x, means that the difference f of x, so the first part is still same, minus f of xg. xg means that the index, the a is just single index. So we call the difference operate. So also we use the definition in Chattach's paper. So we introduce t sub a, defined by, you know, all those possible g does not belong to a, and the difference that are g, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I don't know how the Chattach invented that's the, the T here. So all the subset, possible uh, subset, all the possible subset A in the from one to N. So introduce that's, uh, that's the, uh, that's the uh, random variable T, which is uh, kappa A, which is a constant and times the TA, which is defined by this one. And you can imagine that there's, you know, how many terms you can involve because from one to n, n, in, uh, n numbers. So you pick all the possible subsets, then put that together, okay? So the key observation is that the difference between f of x and f of x uh, prime, the independent copy, actually is equal to the the combination sum of those ki, uh, kappa i and ta, which is two times t. I think that's the main reason he, uh, the, he introduced that's the, the, the line of variable t here. So put all those together, it turns out the difference is simply equal to that's line of variable two times t here. So I think the key observation or key lemma is that you write the covariance function of two random variables, f of x and g of x, which of course by definition just g of the expected g of x times f x minus f of x the independent copy. That's of course the well-known fact. Now the difference you see that can be written as, you know, those two t here, which is exactly equal to kappa a times, uh, times that guy, okay, put all those together. So then you, you look at that part, expect g of x, the difference that are g and so on, and using the symmetric properties. So the xj is replaced by x, the independent copy. So it turns out 
you can introduce g of x, you can change g of x as the difference between g of x and uh, g of x prime, or x to, uh, to g here. Okay. So that introduces this part. So now you see that this part more or less like uh, the t, similar to t here. So using this identity, so Chattaji writes the experiment w phi of, phi of w phi is any nice function, and uh, because if you still remember the uh, Stein's equation, which is the expected W phi of W minus the expected of the phi derivative equals the index function or the H of W and so on. So the key part there to write the expected W phi W in terms of the expected of the derivative. Now you see that W phi of W, you see that, so you can change F of X is W here, which is itself is a function of X. So W is equal to, uh, just recall that, So right now we assume W is equal to F of X, okay? So the expected of W times phi of W, which is nothing else, just mean the expected value of F of X, right? Times phi of F of X, okay? So that's our F of X, just like in the correct function there. And this part, phi, phi of f put together is, uh, is our function g. So we can apply this, uh, uh, because the expected value f of x actually is zero, so therefore you can write this covariance between f of x and phi of f of x, right? So you apply this covariance function, so you change, so keep it as f of x here, then g is equal to phi of f and put it together, and uh, then he managed to prove that, you know, it's bounded by the second derivative of the function phi times the sum of uh, the difference of f g of x here to the power of three. So that's a very nice formula, of course, and from start from here, if you work in Stan's method, I believe most of us actually work in Stan's method, and you know how to get the, uh, the, the what's the distance, because if you, if you look at that, the Stein equation, so W of phi of W minus uh, the, okay, maybe derivative first, phi of four. So equal to a function, giving function H and minus the expected H of Z. And Z stands for the standard number and variable, okay? So that's part, so you see that expected phi of, so that's one, and you compare with, so now we look at the expected phi derivative of W minus the expected value of W phi of W, right? And of course, that's all it can be written as the expected value of minus the expected value of phi derivative of W times T. So of course we need to put back that term. So that is uh, minus the expected of phi derivative w and t here. So according to that key of uh, key lemma here, key step, you already have that difference for this term, and that guy you see that just equal to. So that term just equal to the derivative of phi and one minus t here. And further you can put a condition expected value, so you can change to, you can also change to, so the condition expected value of t given w, right? And because usually if, you are, if h is bounded, or maybe the derivative of h is bounded, then the solution, the derivative of the solution phi also is bounded. So that term is bounded by one, and times just expected value of uh, the absolute value of one minus the condition expected t given w. So that's you can immediately can write, get the, uh, the, the L1 bond for the, for that situation. So that's exactly the, the next theorem. So we recall that, so w is f of x, now we assume that the expected w is zero, and without, without loss of generality, which we assume the second moment is, uh, is one. 
Okay, so T A is still defined that way, and T is one half all the possible combination of T sub A. So Chataji proved that the uh, L1 norm is bounded by you know one the expected one minus the condition expected T given W, and plus you know that term come from the uh, actually from that's uh, that's difference here. And you further can take the square root of uh, the uh, the square root of the second moment of that quantity, and which becomes the variance of the condition expected value of t given given w. Okay. So that's a very nice result. And uh, the next question is that what is the late uh, the chromogram's distance? And uh, uh, I think for those who expect work on the chromogram's distance and the uh, L1 distance, of course, we know that sometimes the technique is very, very different. If you want to get the optimum uh, commodity distance, it takes much more work uh, to, to do, okay? And uh, so in 2017, uh, sorry, I always had a hard time to pronounce the names, and but, uh, Giovanni and his co-authors proved that. Ah, <laughs> Rafi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Rafael, okay. <laughs> and they say we use the same notation as before. And uh, so they prove that the first two terms, no, the first term is the same. Okay, that term and the last term is the same as the, in, in the L1 distance. And they also introduce the extra term T tilde here, and the, which is defined by, it's very similar to T here. You know, if you look at the definition of T sub A, is the difference between delta J A of X and delta J A of X A here. So the change, the delta J, that second term here, that's term, put the absolute value, okay? Then we call this the T tilde A. So the, then we replace T A by T tilde A, we call it the, the total sum, we call it T tilde. Okay. So they have extra terms. So the second term is the expected value of of the absolute value of e, the quadratic expected t tilde given x, and plus the second, uh, there's third term, so the difference to the power six, then take square root, and so on. And they have very, very nice uh, applications for you know, that's general result to get the optimal convergence distance for, uh, for, 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 different, for different applications. Okay, okay any questions? So what I want to share with you is that we can get a new balancing bond. It's what it means that the actual term, you know, those terms actually is, we can, you know, uh, we can get off those uh, two, the last two terms. The first two terms are actually good enough to get the commodity distance. So let's see how to prove that's a result because I think we can use a few pages, maybe one or two pages to share, to share with you the proof for that's a, that's a result. So as usually we start with Stein's equation, so we see that for any given z, we solve that Stein's equation phi of w minus w, phi of w is equal to the indicate function minus the standard normal distribution function. Okay, that's as always. So the key step is, is to prove that the expected value of w phi of w minus the expected phi derivative of w and t, the same t as we talked about before, actually is bounded by this quantity. So four times the expected value of the absolute value of the expected t tilde given x. The definition of t tilde is the same as we just introduced, okay? So as long as we can prove that's a result, then we already prove, you know, the, the, the Bellison bond. Because the first term comes from the expected value of phi derivative of w minus uh, one, uh, one minus the square TW. So that's a key step is to just prove that, to prove that that's difference without actual condition to prove that is actually is bounded by that quantity. Okay, now let's see how to prove that's, uh, that's an inequality. And we start with, again, we start with uh, the square W phi W as always. So we, we look at so we need to use the, okay, so maybe we introduce the, uh, 
some notations here, R A J, which is the difference between delta G phi of uh, phi of f x, which is phi of w, and delta g f f of x a, and tilde is defined by, you know, very similar just change to. Uh, change that should be the absolute value. Oh, anyway, that's the r a g tilde, which is we change the difference to the the derivative f derivative f of x and so on. So that's part actually same as in Chatterjee's paper. Okay? We didn't. Uh, he also introduced uh, that's the, the those random variables. So start from Chattaj's paper, so we like the expect W phi of W minus the expect phi delta of W times T. So that's of course by definition is F of X times phi of F of X because W is equal to F of X here. Yeah? And we keep that notation the same quantity here. Then we use the property we mentioned before, it's a one half and uh, Kappa A and so on, because the, that's the difference. I think if you still remember the identity we talked about before at the beginning, yeah, that's identity. Start from here. Okay, so we can write at the, as to, in terms of that difference. Okay. Okay, so now we put back everything to so that quantity. You see that that can be written as the expectability of R, R, R sub A G, and that's quantity. So that's why we introduce that notation R A G here, and minus the expectability of R tilde A G here. Okay. So that step is the same as in the Chattaj's proof, because when he proved the, the L1 norm, he also used that argument. Yes, sure. Yes, common participant. Yes, yes. Uh, the five prime, of course, is uh, uh, okay. I think except one point, the five prime is not defined. Yeah. So otherwise, the five prime is, is, is still well defined. Yeah, of course. Maybe you can define the uh, use the. I don't know, define as zero of, uh, uh, or some of the continue point, something like that, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but you are right, because the, the five prime is not, is not defined at the z, one point is not well defined. But I think you can, we can uh, define, because most of the time, actually, what we use is actually the integral, because that's the expected value, so we're not causing any problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's another, another way to define that, but yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's one version just according to the equation, defined the derivative added according to the equation. That's one way. Okay, now let's look at the difference between the, those two random variables, R A G and um, the R tilde R A G here. And that's the definition of the RAG, and that's the definition of R tilde. The difference that just like the derivative, if you look at the, the Taylor expansion, so more or less like the Taylor expansion at f of x. Okay. So the main term of course, that's back to the definition of delta g here, phi of f of x minus phi of f. The, uh, actually, that is uh, the delta g f x. Sorry. The f of x prime. Uh, xg here, which can be written as f of x minus the difference. Okay, so if you look at the definition of uh,
right? So that is, uh, okay, we have the phi of uh, delta g of uh, phi of x. So that is phi of a of x minus phi of a of x j, right? Which of course we keep that phi of a of x that term minus phi of a of x minus a of, uh, a of x minus a of x j, right? So that's term a of x minus a of x g is nothing as just delta g a of x, right? So that becomes so phi of a of x minus phi of a of x minus delta g a of x. Then we keep that's the, uh, the last term here. Then we write everything in terms of difference in terms of the, the derivative, because the phi of a number here minus phi of another number, so the derivative phi of w, a of x of course just equals w, so phi of derivative of w plus t minus phi derivative of w dt, and we, we take the common term delta g a of x a here. So that's come from that, uh, all those, you know, the first term has that delta g a of x a, the second term also has delta g a of x a, so we take all, all that term out, we move that term out. So now you see that we're back to the definition of the f, because a, with definition of phi here, because phi is a satisfied stance equation, uh, of course that's line of the indicate function. So that becomes, so w, so that phi of w is equal to w times phi, uh, phi of w plus the indicate function, okay? So put together, so w plus t, times phi of w plus t, that minus w phi w, so that's, term, that's first term. The second term, the indicate function. So the indicate function w plus t less than equal to z minus the indicate function w less than equal to z, so dt. So we kill that term there. So no, line of the metric is that the function, we know that the function w phi of w actually increase function because that's very special function, the solution to Stein's equation. Uh, the, the, the function h is the indicate function, then we have that nice property. Okay. And for this property, so maybe for any function which we call a g here, so if, suppose the function g is a non decreased function, then we look at the integral from a to 0 and g of w plus t minus g of w dt. What happened? So W is any given number, and A also is, is any given number. So now you imagine that if A itself is less than zero, then the GW plus T is less than G of W, so that term is negative, right? So the whole integral actually is negative. And uh, if A is positive, then the integral from A to zero, you change to zero to A, so it's minus the integral zero to a, then g of w plus t minus g of w. So that's number, that's the integral always non-negative, right? So that term is always, sorry, it's, it's always non-positive, okay? So for any a, for any w, it's always non-negative, uh, it's uh, non-positive. And you can also get it the, the lower bound, which is equal to because the function non decreasing so that's equal to g of w plus a minus g of w times a. So whether a is positive or negative, that's always true. So that's the key observation uh, in, the, in the proof, actually. So because I want to change it to is non-negative, so I switch the w plus t and the 
and uh, W here. So W phi of W minus W plus T phi of W plus T. So therefore, so it's, it's, not, it's not negative, and at the end, it's bounded by delta G F X, the difference between those two terms. And I think that is, uh, we keep, okay. So that's W phi of W, then W minus delta G F X. So we look, look back at the definition of W, which is uh, F of X. So W minus delta G F X change back to F of X G. So that is W minus uh, times phi of W minus phi of X G and times phi of F of X G. So that is, that's part is for random variables. Then we put the expert value on both sides. So you see that the expert value so now we put the absolute value because that, that's, that's the inside always, uh, okay, because that term could be, you know, that guy could be positive, could be negative. So we put the absolute value for that term. So we keep the absolute value here. Then inside the integral, the, absolute, the spare value of this integral, and you see that, so that's equal to, okay, delta GFX is come from here. So you keep that's delta GFX. And the, the inside is the expert W, phi of W minus phi of xj and phi of a of xj. Okay, that's the key that term. Okay, we keep the first term, then look at the second term, and so on. When we exchange xj and the independent copy, then that term a of xj change back to a of x. And uh, Okay, so fxg change back to w, then delta g fx change back to the negative f of x. Then the absolute value of that term will not change because Lina will assume that g does not belong to a. Okay. So when we exchange xg and xg prime here, so the whole thing, that term is, so the negative, okay, that term is the same as before, but a delta g changed to negative. So that's why it's that equal back to the expert w phi of w. So keep that as delta g f x and so on. So now you more or less we can get the, uh, the bond we need. Okay, so that's the, if you look at the difference between the i g here, you know, that's the, the first term. But the second term, we can do this almost the same because the indicate function also is not, uh, the indicate function of course is uh, non decrease, can non increase function, the indicate function. So we can apply the same technique uh, to, to, to estimate that term. The only thing that the w phi of w changes to the indicate function. So the, at the end, we get that's bound. So that's uh, what I said before, because the indicate function, if you big than z, is non decrease function. So, the, so therefore, what we have at the beginning, so the constant cover A times the sum of all those g does not belong to A, the absolute value of the difference between those two expired values. So it can be bounded by that quantity. So w phi of w plus the indicate function and times the others. Okay? So now we call it, as we use definition, the whole summation here is called a two times t tilde here. Then we're giving the condition expert value. So giving x first, then we take the condition expert value. And after we do the condition expert value, then we can use, because w phi of w is bounded by one. So, you, so that term is bounded by one. The unique function, of course, also bounded by one. So we have four times the expert value, then we put it, put it absolute value here, condition. So the proof is, uh, is uh, if you look at the proof, I think just it's not that, that complicated, but of course, the, it's closely based on this property, the solution W times the solution phi of W is non decrease function. So similarly, if you want to do the non-normal approximation, as long as the solution has those kind of property, and you can also do it for the non-normal approximation.
So one remark is that, you know, the t to the a, the absolute value, that term can change to any function or any land variable satisfy some symmetrical property and a big than or equal to the absolute value of the difference, then you can, you can do it. For example, you can choose this, that's fun, that's random variable as one half, just use Cushing inequality because that's the absolute value of course is bounded by one half delta plus that's quantity squared divided by delta. Because sometimes it may be easy to calc, it's, it's not so easy to calculate the absolute value times, you know, those quantity. You can change to the constant of course is, is easy to calculate. Then delta, that term becomes a square. Maybe sometimes it's also easy to manage it. Okay, so that is just one remark. Uh, you, you can see from proof, you can see that that's still true. Okay, any questions? Yes. By one. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you can do it, but uh, I think that it's, it's not easy to, uh, especially, you know, that's indicate function is really hard to get a little off. Because. Yeah. Right, 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 right. right. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, but you still have, you have the phi derivative. Yeah, if you back to Stein's equation, the phi derivative, you have this term, and it's not easy to handle it. Yeah, phi prime, yes. But the, the problem is how to, but you know, if you phi prime times this guy here, it's still very complicated, maybe. So that's why we just simply use the, the upper bound to control. And the second remark, of course, as mentioned earlier, that you know sometimes it's not easy because there are too many terms. You take all the sub possible subsets. It's, uh, although in the Chattaj give several very, very uh, uh, interesting examples where he could manage to compute those, those terms, but uh, still it's very complicated, I, I thought. So, so that's why we, we come to the idea that maybe we can simplify the proof a little bit. I mean, introduce a simple version of T, and which is, uh, we can do it that way. So we introduce the A sub, sub G is the, the set from one to G, all those, uh, the G point, the G integers here. And then you, of course, f of x minus f, uh, x prime can be written as f of x a j minus one minus f of x j. So as long as you have this identity, the next step for more or less are same. Okay, you can introduce the t here. So that's the way of course the covariance function, you still have, you know, those kind of, uh, similar identities. So line only one summation. So you can compute it. Then you use the, you know, we, then we can introduce the, T, just one summation, delta j f of x, delta j f of x, a j minus one, and, and similarly we can introduce the t tilde, we change the absolute value. So therefore we can, you know, uh, just follow all those uh, proofs one by line, uh, one line by one line, and you can, you can believe that, that just equals, we still have that little out, and also the commutative distance. Okay. And hopefully, uh, you know, this version may be easy for, for some examples, not all, for all those examples, uh, but I believe maybe, you know, for some examples, if you just simply use this version, it's enough to compute the commercial distance and also the A1 distance. So maybe I have a couple uh, minutes to talk about uh, examples. One is Alice Lenny Landon graph, as I think uh, several people already talked about that's the example before. So that's a simple case. You have n voters and at the edge, each edge is connected with probability p, where p could depend on n here. So then we use simple versions of y is the number of triangles. And it standardize it, of course, the, you know, uh, like uh, Angel also with authors prove that 
the, the, the what is the distance? So when p between one half and one, that's rate, and between n to the power minus one half to one half is another rate, and so on. And I believe that's L term is, uh, is optimal, right? Yeah, I think that's the, the L term is, is optimal. So the question is that whether you can get the, the same chromophore distance for this example. So Agent proved that uh, that is true, okay? But I believe his proof is quite complicated because, <laughs> yeah, so many cases. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the proof is correct, but at least the result is true because we use our simple version to prove it. <laughs> So we calculate, you know, based on the new result and so on, and we manage to prove the same result. So I believe, you know, uh, I mean, you know, I didn't check the uh, step uh, one line by one line, but I believe it's a uh, proof. But it's just too complicated, that's too, too many ca different cases. But our proof also is not that simple, but it's still, it's uh, not that complicated. I think we have uh, six cases or seven cases. <laughs> yeah. So another example we want to see, you know, we're just back to the the symmetric functions, which you also uh, discussed in the Janov's uh, Kivanda's uh, uh, paper, two thousand eight uh, seventeen. So we use the same notation as before in in that paper, the difference operator and so on, and especially the same quantity B and F looks uh, quite complicated. I don't know uh, whether it's possible to simplify those versions or not, but, but uh, we didn't try very hard. We're still, uh, we are still working on that paper, so therefore, so the, uh, at that moment, we still use the same notation B and F and B and prime of F and so on. It's all the difference operators. And so, so just use the, uh, the Calculation in the Kivana's uh, paper, so we managed it because right now we only have the first two terms. So those two those terms actually come from the estimate in the first two terms. So we don't have the actual uh, two terms. So that that's the the main point. But I don't know whether it's possible to simplify that L term or not using the simple version of a T. That's I'm not so sure at this moment. So maybe I'll. Let's look at one example we called a set of formation for volume of convex set. So K is a convex set in the cubic. So 0, 1 to the power D here, the D dimensional cubic. So X is not, it's not a random vector, but it's a, it's a set of all those random points, Xi. So we assume that Xi is already uniform distributed on the, uh, on the cube. So phi of X is uh, so the volume of k can be approximated by this function phi of x. And that's phi of v of xi is so-called the Bologna cell with nucleus x among all those x. So it's defined by this way. So there are quite a number of papers to discuss the rate of convergence. Of course, the first step is discuss the convergence, then discuss the rate of convergence, and so on. So that is some... Uh, Notations, maybe you, you can excuse that part. What I want to show you is, is that in their papers, when you standardize it in a convergent normal distribution, then the variance of phi of x has that order n to the power minus 1 minus alpha over d, and especially for the Bellison bond, they have the extra term log of n. So now using our new result, so then we can get a little of this, the log term here. So we can manage, we can manage to uh, remove that uh, log, uh, log n terms. So we still don't know whether it's optimal or not, but uh, uh, I don't know, because that's, it's already quite complicated, all the calculations. Alpha depends on the condition. Yeah. The volume of the boundary of k, uh, that's not the, the, with distance r here, so that's the, with distance r, so it's bounded by some, has the same order as r to the power alpha. So alpha is here, here. So 
So maybe I'd, uh, okay, maybe I still have two minutes to uh, share with you the, for the extreme repair approach because the extreme repair sometimes could be useful, uh, although of, uh, maybe sometimes still not easy to compute the condition expired value, which is not so trivial. So, so W lambda is an arbitrary random variable. We introduce independent uh, copy. So W, W, okay, I'll change it to W star here because we all use prime several times. So w, there are the difference. And we look at it, we assume that the condition expected value of the difference given W is a linear function of W. So lambda times W plus some error terms. And the condition second moment is two lambda times one plus R2. So more or less like a constant to lambda here. And of course, it's known that if R1 plus R2 comes to zero in probability, and also the delta, the absolute delta over delta, sorry, I think cube, not one. Yeah, over the delta cube over lambda. So it's, yeah, that's converge to zero. Then the W converges to the standard normal distribution. This is part of where not it out. And for the Bayesian bond, so we have the same assumption then we see that the local distance, actually the expected value of R1 plus the expected R2, then plus one over lambda, the lambda come from here, times the expected value of, the absolute value of the condition expected value delta times delta tilde given W. So delta tilde is any random variable which is symmetric with respect to W and W star. The big center equal to the absolute value of delta. You can just simply put the absolute value of delta here. So that's the general bond. And for this, for the normal approximation, and of course the proof just more or less like what I showed you before. And for general situation, maybe is the function of g here, the condition expected value that they are given w is a function of w, so we call it g of w here. And the second con condition, second moment is more or less like a linear part to lambda one plus r two. So now we assume that the function g is non-decreasing function. And with our loss generality, we assume g of zero is zero, and also satisfy this condition. The second, you know, the two times derivative of g square minus g of w times g second derivative is non-negative. And we in this con condition to guarantee that the solution to Stein's equation w times phi of w, we, we thought before still is non-decreasing function, which, because we need to have this condition, and turns out we need to put a, a condition for the function g here. So now g of y is the integral of g of t, small g of t, and the p of y is the density function, uh, normal and constant e to minus g of y. Okay. So then we have similar results as in the normal case. So the form is exact same. Okay. The r1, the expected r1 plus the r2, and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, there are some examples because Zhu worked on some examples before, and he said for some examples we don't need to have the, uh, go back to the comp uh, the complicated version. Yeah, because uh, so. Yeah, because remember you, you mentioned that for some example, we still need to back to the, the simple version that does not work. Oh, the sum is easy. But back to all those uh, different cases, I think it's, uh, for the, if T, uh, W itself is sum of XI, and that's back to all those the classical case. Yeah, still computable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, no, no, I think if you really want to get one over square of n converge rate, 
then we need to assume the fourth moment is finite because that's the involved the xi square term. So if you want to get the one over square of n rate, we need to assume the fourth moment is bounded something like. That. Yeah, so, so that's, a, we, we cannot go back to exactly like the classical case, only assume finite total moments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. You use the fourth moment, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You think that's argument that we cannot get it. We have to go because you we have the absolute you know one minus uh, the condition variance the square root of the condition variance. So that's term you and you take a square root and you, if you want to assume the final total moment that we cannot get it the one of square band. So we need to assume the fourth moment is bound is bound to something, then you get a square of n rate conjugate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you.